Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Felix LaHaye, who is the founder of United Esports. He's got a tremendous career and is going to share on influencer marketing, marketing non-endemic brands to esports, and Meltdown Bars, which is a gaming bar concept coming to the States. Join me in talking to Felix. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Felix LaHaye. He is the founder of United Esports and has a pretty incredible career. Uh, Felix, thank you for joining me on the on the podcast today. Hey, John, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So today you are the founder of United Esports. You've got your hands in all sorts of different things. Um, did a little research on you and I saw that number one, you're a trailblazer in influencer marketing. Number two, I'm pretty sure you were a songwriter and a performing artist way back in the day. <laughs> That's true. And so one, the- yeah, one of the things I find so fascinating about successful people is how you got here. And so can you help our audience understand, uh, you know, age 19, age 18, uh, to where you, where you are today? My quick, uh, my quick resume from, uh, as told, uh, as told live. So basically when I was a teenager, so I'm born and raised in, in, um, in Canada, I'm from Montreal, Quebec. So French Canada, hence the accent. Uh, I went to to high school in Europe, uh, my dad being, uh, you know, wanting to move there. And I started playing music. This was the early 2000s when bands like The Strokes and The White Stripes and, you know, The Libertines were making kind of that comeback of of rock and roll uh, in the very early 2000s. And we had, I was going to high school in Paris at the time, and there was this little scene there, and we had a band as part of that scene. It was more of a punk hard rock band that did fairly well. You know, we toured a bit and we had a record deal and um, we played over 200 shows. And doing this, I ended up coming to, to Los Angeles uh, on the music side and I fell in love with the city. So I went to school, university, undergrad and postgrad in economics. And when I was done with that, I had a sm- short stint in the radio back home in Montreal. And then I um, moved to L.A because I love the city. Uh, I didn't have a particular plan, uh, but I said, it's great, let's go there. Very quickly, uh, we started a company that became uh, the first influencer marketing company as we know it today. I'm pretty convinced I bought the first paid for post on Instagram. There were trades wow. happening, you know, uh, and people with a lot of followers back then I had 50,000 followers uh, and I paid a whopping $20 uh, for a post <laughs> for something we we're trying to market. Very quickly, uh, the word spread that our company, which was called Instabrand um, back then, um, was doing this. And we signed a bunch of, uh, of fashion brands in L.A. for very small, mm. small deals. But, you know, you have, you know, fifteen hundred, three thousand, four thousand dollars uh, and you have, you know, back then it was still a time where you would go and meet with CMOs and VPs of marketing. And they would say, I don't believe in social media. No, I don't right. believe in, in, in influencer marketing. So what year was that? Uh, 2012 is when we started. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, just around, you know, before the, the, I think the Instagram purchase by, by Facebook Inc. Um, so we did that. I mean, and grew that company to be in, in, um, in, in five countries and cities. We say it's the, you know, the, first influencer marketing company as we know it today, because there were blogs, bloggers were huge. People were buying blog posts, people yeah. were doing YouTube, but the marketing on mobile, pure social platforms was a new thing. Um, so we, I did that for a long time. And after uh, seven years at that company, uh, I left uh, uh, to create uh, United Esports. Hmm. And United Esports is a multimedia um, company in esports and gaming uh, that does a few things, uh, including being one of the market leaders in uh, esports marketing uh, and uh, other elements. We have a, a venture fund where an ownership of 
uh, uh, Kappa Meltdown, the largest esports uh, e bars chain in the world. So I really shifted all my, my focus from influencer marketing uh, to um, esports and gaming media. And within that, there is a, a marketing department. The DLC Drop podcast is sponsored by iShaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, what I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality, and the customization. iShaker is a Shark Tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez, owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my iShaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for iShaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your iShaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC Drop branded iShaker at iShaker.com forward slash DLC Drop. Save 20% on all iShaker products with the discount code DLC Drop. Really cool. I, I see a pretty direct line uh, through your career path and it's really interesting. Sometimes people are like myself, never thought I'd end up here. And sometimes yeah. it looks like you've really built this pipeline from... Uh, you know, being a performer yourself, being an influencer, one could argue, uh, to then paying influencers and then building that to, to deeper marketing. What was it that helped you identify that influencer marketing was powerful before just about anybody else did? It was kind of random, honestly. We, you know, we, um, we just had stuff. Uh, we were around the, the fashion industry and we wanted to, uh, to, to market that. And, you know, we, we saw very quickly, I mean, that's the, an age of influencer marketing where it was incredibly powerful. It's still good for many things, but back then it was just nuts. You would do a post and just as a mean of exemplifying, you do one post on some an account with 50,000 followers promoting mm -hmm. something else, that other account would get 10,000 followers in one post. Right. Uh, because people had never seen that, right? It was still a platform. There was no codes on the platform. And we just saw that it was a, a new paradigm of marketing, truly. Um, so we just started doing it at first for ourselves and then in our immediate circles, and it kind of just kicked up. It, we didn't, didn't immediately plan to do that, but as it was doing well and the returns were amazing, it yeah. became a, a fairly large company. Yeah, I think one of the keys to influencer marketing is the authenticity that this person is saying hey, I'm Kim Kardashian and I use this makeup. And I think the the very early posts uh, were, auth were authentic. It was like, yeah, I just really love this product. And then people like yourself said, wait a minute, what if I paid you to use this product? Um, now everybody's aware of influencer marketing. It's less effective to a point because, you know, hashtag ad, we know when someone is... Uh, is being paid for something. Can you talk a little bit about the differences of influencer when you were trailblazing it and what it's like today? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're right that for a very short period of time, people were not necessarily aware, but I mean, it was a very short period. I mean, for us, we started doing hashtag ads and sponsored by within the first few months of, of being in business because uh, the thesis was that the advertising message needs to be content of equal quality or as enjoyable as the non-advertising content. And we never wanted to take the audience for idiots saying, haha, we will you know, back channel it. They shouldn't know. Uh, otherwise it won't work. I generally believe that people, young people then and young people now, uh, because that's always been uh, in everything I do, that's always been the, the target audience, you know, the, the 18 to 30s, I mean, they shift, they get older. I'm not right. out of that age range myself. But um, all this to say that people are, are smart. They know that it's an advertisement, right? But it's about pr providing uh, an advertisement that is good quality and that is targeting them well. And as a result, they, they tend to accept it um, very well. I mean, many times you see influencers, creators, streamers 
the audience is happy to see that they are uh, that they are advertising because it means that they're making good money as long as they're not doing something that treats them like idiots or as um, right. contrary to their values. What is it that brands get right and what is it that they get wrong about influencer marketing from your perspective? It's changed a lot. Um, you know, no, it's, I mean, there, there, there is few, there's few generalities that are left. I would say the only thing wrong that is still common is insisting on influencers that are not necessarily a good fit. It's not because you as a marketer like, you know, John Davidson, the influencer, mm-hmm. that he is a, a good, uh, a good, uh, brand ambassador for your brand you need to be able to dissociate what you like in your private life and what is actually good for for your brand and Mm. of course a lot of brands have and you know it takes introspection but some brands have a you know a skewed perception of how the where they stand currently in in the market and that's you know that's why they they want to market differently etc and and also, I, I would say the other thing is it, it's important to understand if you're maximizing for content or if you're maximizing for returns. And it's not always uh, it's not always um, the same thing. Yeah, take me a little deeper into maximizing for content and returns. Um, how are those approaches different if you're trying to achieve one rather than the other? So one of the really important things about influencer marketing today, and it's always been the case, but it's even more so now because the pricing has changed completely. The rise on one post has changed completely is the ability to create authentic, organic, uh, you know, engaging content in the same tone of voice that, um, that the, the creators would normally create. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of strategies now that leverage creators, influencers, streamers to create content, of course, post on their organic channels because we have a holistic approach to how this content is going to then live later on. And that's very important. If you know you're going to um, put a $500,000 Twitch buy under an ad that you make you're leveraging streamers, you don't necessarily need to pick the streamers that have the biggest organic audience. You need to pick the streamers that when it's going to run on Twitch is going to maximize the ROI on this uh, or the effectiveness, the brand love of this ad buy. And Twitch is just an example. It's the same on Insta, TikTok, et cetera. If you, for whatever reason, budget constraints, a strategy, et cetera, are not going to do this, you want to maximize for the people who are, have the audience that's immediately going to be most engage with your with your post. Um, this is an over generalization, but it's 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 quite accurate. Interesting. So, okay, so you're at uh, you're doing influencer marketing for about seven years. You left to found United Esports. Was there some catalyst that put esports on your radar? Have you always been a gamer? What made you dive deep into <laughs> esports from broader influencer marketing? I mean, I've always loved these sports. Um, at least I've always loved gaming. Uh, you know, people, uh, I've been very involved in gaming as a culture in my entire life. All aspects, really, even back in the days, it, gaming was just a, a version or a, a part of a uh, nerd culture. I mean, I was a sure. and still, I'm a D&D player, a huge Star Trek fan, and I, I've been playing. Wait, are um, you telling me the, the singer, songwriter, the performer on the stage was a closet nerd? I mean, that was an open out. One of <laughs> open the main, main songs was about Star Trek, you know. Yep. Uh, but it's an interesting point you bring out because I played I played sports in university and uh, non varsity in in England. There's no really varsity, uh, and I wasn't very good anyways. But you know, I would frequently lie to my teammates uh, when I didn't want to go to the bars. I would go frequently enough, but because I wanted to go home and play Halo. Yeah. Uh, and I had other buddies. That's what they wanted to do. So. That's one of the major shifts in, in gaming culture nowadays is that gaming is super mainstream. I mean, you yes. see professional NFL players, you know, guys that were, uh, you know, when when I was 22, uh, would never have 
openly admitted that they spend 50 hours playing video games. Now, the coaches love it, right? They like that their right. players go home and play games instead of going into getting into trouble. So okay. I've always been involved. I mean, I played, I really got into pure esports with StarCraft 2. Yep. Uh, I was a, 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 you know, a decent player. I was a diamond player in StarCraft 2. Nice. Uh, and I, I started watching and I, I never stopped. So that's how I, you know, from a personal standpoint, got involved. And from a business standpoint, I just, I thought it was a, you know, esports had been a bit undercover for, for a second. And a, a few years ago, it was a, it was just about to hit that, uh, that inflection point and, and it did around the time where I came in. And what year was that when you founded the United Esports? 2018. I okay, mean, it great. was already, esports was already huge. There was already a lot right. of things. I'll, the reason I, 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 of course, I'm not trying to take credit, but when we founded United Esports, I'll tell you one of the big differences in 2018, when we talked about the marketing side, when we would go to brands, they would say esports, bunch of kids in their mom's basement. I don't know. You Stereotype. Know, the same thing as uh, I don't believe in social media. And, and nowadays it's... Uh, I don't believe in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but it's esports. Like, I know I want to be in. How do I get in? Right. There's been an enormous shift from the, truly that came around the pandemic time where Esports as it was already huge, hundreds of millions, etc. But the outside perception has changed. Well, I really love what you're doing. I'm a big believer in gamers, really understand gaming, gaming culture, but also understand marketing, uh, sure. bringing in these non-endemics. Because one of my, uh, I, I used to be the head of partnerships at GameStop, and so one of the things that I experienced there, talking to a lot of brands, talking to a lot of teams, is seeing that a lot of these non-endemic brands don't understand how to get into the space in the right way. And so when they don't market correctly to the audience, they don't receive the ROI, right? And so a lot of times, rather than saying, oh, we did this wrong, it's the space isn't ready, this doesn't work, X, Y, Z. And because partnership dollars are the number one source of revenue, we are so reliant on that revenue. I love companies like yourself where you are helping these brands generate an ROI because you're teaching them how to approach the space in the right way and with award-winning work. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about your process, your approach? I'm sure it's different for different brands, but if I'm a non endemic brand listening to this podcast, what should I be doing to engage the esports audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> It's, you know, our, our, our company motto is if it's fun for us, it's fun for them. And at the end of the day, that means you need to do something that's going to be fun for the audience. When you're doing something in gaming, you're dealing with people's area of passion. Uh, that's where a lot of the young uh, of people, you know, I say young people, I age myself, <laughs> Gen Zs. Uh, yeah, I'm in my mid 30s now. We're so. at Gen Alpha now. I mean, I was I was listening to a yeah, panel the other day that talked about Gen Alpha. Alpha. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't do as much with Gen Alpha. Candidly, our, our specialty we do a little bit, maybe 10, percent but our, our, our a little under our specialty is Gen Z. Um, you know, so I should stop saying young people. Everyone's gonna this old guy. <laughs> we should stop listening to him. Um, I've got so a few years Z, on you, so uh, don't worry about it. I'm the old guy in the room today. <laughs> okay, good. But, well, stop saying young people. I'll say that these are great uh, adults in Gen Z. Yeah, um, which is true. Um, for them, gaming esports is, a, and, and, and for millennials, all the millennials that are involved, it's a form of social interaction, right? It is, mm -hmm. people think gaming, they think, you know, one of the first things brands that are new to the space ask is, how do we make whatever, a, an item of our brand into the game? And so, well, we could do that, uh, but truly there is so much more to gaming culture, esports culture, than playing video games. There's, you right. know, shows, celebrities, music, fashion, um, socializing is the main, the main point. So community, right? Thing, pardon me? Community. Community. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, the first thing to say is what are you, how are you going to provide value to them? And value does not mean, you know, how are you going to bribe them? If you make a great show, um, you know, we had a, a show I, I always talk about that we did a, a couple of years ago, but it's a very good exemplification. Uh, one of our partners is Tide. Uh, one of the, the, you know, I'm very proud to say one of the many Procter & Gamble brands we work with. Yep. Um, 
they uh, we made a show for them called the Tide Laundry Trials, which was a two month program where gaming superstars, esports players, football players, celebrities were playing against each other in video in, in esports titles uh, with a series of handicaps, of course, to determine who's going to have to do the laundry. And <laughs> nice. You know, it was That's it was fun. really fun to watch. You know, so people, you know, there, there was, you know, one one of the ones I always liked that we did is that one of the chess grandmasters. She was playing against a, a streamer that had never played chess in his life, learned mm. one day before. So she had, I think, three seconds on her clock for the entire game. Oh wow! And yeah, he had like fifteen minutes, and then his whole <laughs> audience was there. Like you know, people in the people in the stream, like, dude, move, whatever nights to hear uh, and that's fun people that want fun. to watch stuff like that uh and uh want a couple of hours etc but uh, that's the idea you know if you just want to come in and and, and you want to just be you known it's perfectly okay to say hey i'm going to sponsor one of your tournaments i'm going to be the presenting sponsor but the first thing we're going to do is say okay what kind of segment can we make for you guys it's right. great to put your logo in the corner but let, let's start talking about the brands let's have fun with it so i think that the brands that have the most success are the ones that are ready to have fun in gaming i mean gaming is fun right I mean, yeah we're not here to, <laughs> to, to do so that that's it that's that's kind of my Five seconds. You know, I, I wanted to make it a five second answer, but it'd be in a five minute answer. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Um, uh, let me give you my perspective, and I'd like to get your take yeah, to on my perspective. So, I think one of the challenges uh, for brands who are non endemics from out, not from gaming, not headphones, peripherals, gaming, etc. Uh, Tide is a good example. Is that esports has been around for about twenty years and has sure. been under supported undervalidated and just recently now that the cool kids are gaming and gamers are the cool kids everybody's rolling up hello fellow kids <laughs> fellow <laughs> gamers right and it's like where have you been homie you know like i've been doing this and you just found out that that i have money and you want it right and so there's that skepticism to start my belief in how brands can be successful is by enhancing experiences in meaningful ways. I have a kind of a, a quote, uh, which is, if you can give the audience, give the community what they want, but cannot attain from themselves, your brand will be embraced. And so I think it's about identifying what are the pain points? What are the needs, right? Like if I go to an event, what could be better? Well, my cell phone keeps running out of battery or I can't get Wi-Fi here or I'd love to meet those pro players or, you know, what is an Instagrammable moment where I give my friends FOMO and they and I generate a ton of likes because this brand gave me this thing or what is like the Tide thing? What is super engaging, super fun content or in game? How did you make my game better in a super cool way? We see Fortnite doing a ton of integrations and we say NBA 2 k uh, doing a lot as well and other games too that's kind of my stance uh what is your reaction to that would you disagree or add to it or agree well first of all for years we had that meme in our sales deck uh how do you do fellow kids yeah uh, so you know I agree. I think, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right that this is the, the core to absolute success. If you, if you manage to create, to create, you know, to identify a need and solve for that need uh, by, by nature, you, you're going to be a, a, a great, uh, a great success in the space. It had, I will add a couple of points. Uh, um, first, you need to have that commitment. Many of the true mm. challenges in gaming are very complicated to solve. They're not necessarily a five second, even, um, you know, it's going to sound funny, but many challenges in gaming are not a multi hundred thousand dollar solve. They're mega solves. Yeah. So um, that commitment is very necessary. And we have some of the partners that are incredibly heavily committed to the space. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, they're seeing, seeing great returns. I would say that it's not the, the, I wouldn't say if it's a caveat, but, but another point is it's not because you can't solve a problem in gaming because many brands don't necessarily solve 
a, a, a problem that's related to gaming. Some of them just do some cool stuff, right? Yeah. That you cannot create an entry in the space that continues to add value. You can also uh, entertain, uh, create love, enable. So I, 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 while I agree with you completely, I wouldn't say that brands that feel like, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a cell phone provider. I am not a, you know, something that has an immediate application. It doesn't mean that you can help you. It doesn't mean you cannot help uh, the, 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 the space and succeed in the space right. just by doing something that's awesome. I mean, you see some numbers of brands that, you know, their products are, are great or whatever in many cases, and they're doing amazing stuff in the space. It's because they just kind of get the, they get the audience, they get the brand tone. Yeah. And, and that's also a great key to success. One of my favorite examples, I'm, I'm curious of yours, one of my favorite is Turtle Wax and their work with Optic. Yeah. And um, for the, the audience, I talk about this all the time, so probably a lot of people heard it, but just concisely is essentially Turtle Wax sponsored uh, Call of Duty, the Optic's Call of Duty team uh, with Flame Sword, Hector, and Crim6. And all of them have luxury vehicles that they love. And so essentially they did a bunch of content around it. They wrapped Crim's uh, Porsche in a custom wrap. They had it at Call of Duty World League events. So you had that unique uh, thing where you could take a picture with it and all that stuff. Created a lot of cool content. And a, what I love about that is if you were to ask me, John, what did Turtle Wax probably do in esports? You'd say, well, they probably sponsored Rocket League, right? Or they, or iRacing or something like that. But I love that they identified the non-gaming passion of pro gamers and leaned into that. And so every kid that looks up to Crim6, Hector, and Flamesword, you better believe that when they're going to AutoZone and they're washing their Honda Civic, they feel like they're washing a G-Wagon like Hector or a Porsche okay. like Crim, right? And... I just love that because it's not obvious. And what that shows me, and it was also super successful. I ha I know people over there and I've heard that high ROI. So it wasn't just cool, it, it delivered results. Right. And so that gives me hope for all of these other brands that aren't obvious that, wait a minute, if we just get take a moment to listen to the community, get a little strategic, talk to people like yourself at United Esports, of course, there is a path for just about everybody here to be successful. Absolutely. What are Absolutely. some What are some of your uh, favorites that you've seen? Whether it's ones that you've done yourself or just ones you've you've seen out there by other people. Um, I'll talk about one that I didn't do because it would be a bit self serving, and I guess I'll also talk about the, one of the ones my my team did. One of my favorites, and it's for <laughs> very self-serving reasons, but one of my great favorite moments is when Bud Light heavily invested in Overwatch League. Mm. Uh, and that is, and what they did was pretty pretty cool. You know, it, it was a cool activation with the with the truck that was the payload that people had to touch to try to move, etc. Yeah. But my, my favorite was that it completely overnight dispelled the Gaming is just a bunch of kids in their mom's basement. Mm, yeah. Narrative. Why? Because the you know LDA compliance, so that's the legal drinking age compliance that the you know different regulations are around. You need to be able to prove, depending on the type of broadcast, I give a certain percentage of people watching over the legal drinking age. Uh, well, and what's they, what's interesting to that too, just to chime in, is Overwatch is a title that isn't red blood it's not a mature title so right. the fact that they proved the mature audience in you know you would say oh call of duty obviously or csgo or something but yeah keep going no no but absolutely i, I would guess actually overwatch has a more mature audience than call of duty i mean i have the numbers somewhere interesting the, the, our data team has it but yeah i didn't memorize them uh but anyways but by doing this they were able to show I mean, the first thing I did the next morning is make a case study and go to all these brands. I can guarantee you that Bud Light's legal team looked into this. And that oh, just yeah. showed you that the numbers I've been showing you for, for two years have been true. And so for me, that's my, one of my favorite moments because it really unlocked. I mean, there is, at least at United Esports, there's a before we had that case study and after we had that case study uh, because 
truly the the myth, the stereotype got kind of shattered through that. Bud Light invested for for all of us. So yeah. thanks, Bud Light. I appreciate it. Um, one we did, I mean, I always talked a, a lot about our work with Tampax, mm-hmm. uh, you know, another of the, the Procter & Gamble brands we're involved in. Uh, you know, we, we launched that a few years ago, three, four years ago now. And it was one of the first uh, female-focused brands going into into esports and gaming. Yeah. And I distinctively remember pitching this and the majority of people in the room were saying this is, you know, uh, corp, you know, brand suicide. Gaming is super toxic. It's a bunch of boys, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, and a few people on my team and a couple of the brand directors there, uh, you know, we said, no, no we, we should try it. And it, it was the highest performing campaign of the year that wow. year for 10 packs, everything com- uh, com- combined. It's the highest performing campaign of the year this year. Wasn't wow. last year. I don't know why, but you know, it was still a very good one. <laughs> yeah. They must have done something else with the, the Olympics or something. But you know, it's it's been you know the the, the first campaign a twelve to one positive to negative comment ratio for tampons, and mm. we're, we're literally talking about periods in a gaming uh, um, universe. Right. The last one I think at eighteen to one or something like that. So when you do, we just did something smart. You know, we addressed the audience in a way that they that they liked we talked about something serious uh whilst not making it boring and um it's been uh it's been kicking butts and tampax is now super heavy in in gaming and to me what's that's one of the great success stories that's incredible uh what was the specific strategy or or maybe the cornerstone of the strategy that you would credit for the success of the campaign yeah so they, they, it's, we run something different every year uh, but the, the first one was, was I like the first one a lot. Uh, I mean, the, the, the first one was P, uh, public service, P, fake PSA. So, you know, when you, it's okay. less the case now, but especially uh, back in the days, you would go on, the, on TV and you have those super grim messages in black and white. Or it says like millions of year, you know, every year sometimes, millions of X ways, some awful stuff happens. So yeah. we would start... And I'm the worst actor in the world, so I can't really react it. But we picked, you know, a, a great number of amazing women in gaming, all, all streamers in different communities and titles. And we produced a spot where each of them, whereby they would start, it was in black and white, it was super start, you know, kind of grim. And it would say every, you know, whatever. Every day, hundreds of thousands of gamers, uh, hundreds of thousands of people dropped from their games. There was like a, a tie-in with gaming, and mm-hmm. it was a, a tie-in with, with with periods, and it was kind of a, a play on words. It was full of puns, and it was really showing that you know the issues um, are around periods are important. They need to there needs to be more education, etc. And we saw all these these young women in the comments and the streams, etc., saying, "Oh my God, I've never known." whatever xyz i'd like to talk more it was followed up but we did a session with a couple of sessions with doctors and and you know health professionals to talk about it so you know we just kind of used a funny trope we made a funny little tune like dee, 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 like with a stars and whatever and mm-hmm. some amazing streaming talents that delivered really fun great messages and uh, everyone loved it and it Tampax has been in the game now for three, four years. We then comfort, you know, we, we've done a bunch of other campaigns, but that was the original one. That's incredible. I think one thing is to that, number one, it shows that uh, gamers can take serious issues. You know, it doesn't always yeah. have to be like silly and fun or, or a toy or a game. Um, the other thing is I think when brand support under supported communities like women in gaming, I've had professional streamers on the show who are who are female who have expressed, you know, developing robust community. Uh, Rebecca Dixon from the Game Hers is a really good friend of mine. I saw her last week. And um, when you're a brand and you go to people who don't have that voice and you say, let me serve you, let me support you, let me listen to you. Boy, this community really responds well to that. Absolutely. I want to pivot over to Meltdown Bars. Because I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, when I was at GameStop, part of my job, probably a lot of people don't even know this, um, is kind of in the background, was researching experiential store concepts. And uh, I was looking all over the world at all sorts of 
different concepts. And one thing I think is really interesting, if you look at the origin of esports, we look at South Korea, right? And we look Mm -hmm. at the gaming centers there. We've seen in the UK success with Meltdown Bars. We've seen success with Belong Gaming Arenas. Uh, I've seen, obviously, Belong has come over to the States. I believe Meltdown is coming to the States, if I have that correct. Yes. So, first of all, tell us, what is Meltdown? And then I'd like to get into a little bit of, like, cultural nuances in different parts of the globe as to what makes it successful. Absolutely. So, Meltdown, uh, now Kappa Meltdown, uh, and core meltdown. So meltdown is the, the first ever chain of esports bars. Uh, we are the largest chain of esports bars in the world. Uh, what is an esports bar? It's a bar dedicated to gaming and to some extent, uh, nerd culture as well. So you yeah. go in order uh, a pint, you can order a cocktail, you can order a uh, Coca-Cola, whatever you're into. Uh, and the screens that we have play esports competitions we have a a lot of things or esports competition gaming content a lot of community events and yeah it's just a a fun place to go uh, meet other people that are into gaming uh, have a pint and be in an environment that uh, is designed for that what do people do wrong and what do they do right when they try to do this concept um I don't know what they do wrong. I know what we, <laughs> what, what, what we do right. I, I mean, you know, Meltdown's a 10-year-old brand at this point. You know, this year we 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 merged with Kappa Esports Bars. Mm-hmm. So Kappa was the, um, the 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 leader in esports bars in Scandinavia. Okay. Uh, and uh, we were uh, the, the leaders uh, uh, of esports bars in other parts of the world. And now we, we merged. And we also launched in... Uh, so uh, launched in the U.S. Uh, as Core Meltdown. So Core Meltdown, Kappa Esports Bars, and Meltdown Esports Bars is the same group. That's that's okay. Cool. That's all us. Um, and you know they're they're different products. The the three, but I think it always comes down to, you know, what makes it. Uh, to actually answer your your question, what makes an esports bar successful is that it is a neighborhood bar where in a neighborhood where there's a lot of gamers and gaming community or people with interest in gaming content. Mm-hmm. An esports bar is not a destination. You will go mm. and you might travel for an hour to go to the esports bar once, but that's not how you make a success. It's not a day. business model. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, so what you're telling me is, uh, so gaming is really about community. And right. um, a lot of that community is online. It can be all around the world. And so what I'm hearing for you is a successful esports bar is developing that community in person in a neighborhood. So what I was, I would assume location would be very important to select your different sites. Yeah. And it, and, and what constitutes a neighborhood bar is very different in each, in each country, right? For example, uh, in Europe where people, um, you know, in, in, some, uh, in big cities where there's a lot of public transport, uh, in Montreal, you know, we have a bar in Montreal. We are just by one of the easiest to get to a subway station. Uh, and that's also consistently uh, close to university. So we get a lot of, I'm having a hard time saying this word, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, we get a lot of people that are going to the universities. They come and hang out at our spot. Uh, in Paris, it's, it's in a neighborhood where a lot of people go and hang out either way. Uh, that's a lot of bars where Gen Z's, young millennials go. In uh, Gothenburg, where it's right in the city center in the coolest part of town. Uh, so also a place that people go. Uh, I'm not saying that unless you have the absolute best real estate in the city, your esports bar will, will fall, uh, fail. But sure. assuming that people will travel an hour back and forth to come to your bar is, in my experience, a mistake. You need to do something that will fit. That's it. It's not about just being close to where people are. It needs to fit their pre-existing going out habits. They're just switching from going right. to whatever, Felix's Tavern to Melbourne Esports Bar because right. that's much more close to their heart and their culture. Interesting. I would believe, too, that the hiring... Uh, would be very important as well because it's not something you can fake, right? You right. show up to the esports bar and nobody knows anything about esports. Uh, that's a hard no. Um, and so I would imagine that 
there might be some groups of people who know restaurants, know that industry and say, oh, gaming's the big thing. Let's do a gaming bar without that particular experience or passion themselves. Um, is that something that you focused on as well, making sure that gamers who really speak the language and part are part of the culture are working these bars? I mean, not to, to say, but what we do is pretty cool. So we, <laughs> we, have, really, <laughs> we, we have really cool people applying to work with us. You know, yeah. people, you know, gaming's market penetration and, and, and presence of gaming culture is now so deep and so many people, you know, it, it's it's funny, but it's almost reached a point, and that's not only from Eldam, that's the same at, you know, United Esports or at our adventures or honestly, every org, every time, you know, all my friends that are executives and, and big esports organizations, mm-hmm. you know, almost it's become a non, almost a non requirement. And you'll see where I'm going in a second to be passionate about esports because we know everyone that we have applying is passionate about esports. Good point. Uh, so say, you know, what the, and this is something I frequently say when I, I speak at universities or things like this, sending an email and saying, I love esports. I want to work here. It's, it's cool. But, you know, uh, it's much better to say, I love esports, like the last hundred emails that you, you have. And I'm good at X, Y, and Z or right. I'm passionate about ABC. I'm a so great that, chef, <laughs> for yeah, example. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you want to work at whatever, I mean, TSM just making up and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're probably going to get more picked up. Say, I'm a great accountant and I'm really passionate about esports. As a matter of fact, I'm whatever grandmaster at league and saying, I really love league. Right. Can I, and assuming that as a reason you could have been 10 years ago, just liking it was enough because it was such a, uh, so much smaller, but now every, everyone likes it. I mean, esports is so, damn cool anyways so why right. wouldn't you like it <laughs> strong point yeah it, it makes me think of uh you know uh phase just came out the other day with a subway sandwich right and yeah, so sure. phase rug came out with the sandwich and my take on it was like okay it's cool like i'm sure that people like more people will order the first one because of phase rug because they're fans of his and everything but success is dependent on that sandwich being really really good Right. And so I would believe, say, to echo your point is if you have a gaming bar, it's just a bunch of gamers don't know a thing about running a restaurant. uh, That thing's going to fail. But if you have people who really know how to run a restaurant, you know, know how to make cocktails, um, are great cooks, uh, great weight staff, et cetera, who are also gamers, which is just about everybody nowadays. Now you're setting yourself up for success. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And, you know, of course, what we try and do, I mean, for us, when we open our, our land licensees, we, we, you know, a lot of the meltdown bars are actually owned by, not by meltdown, but by people who just want to open a bar. We work very closely with them to equip them. So we also see a lot of success stories from entrepreneurs or people who have had a, a really good, you know, you know very dedicated uh, career doing something else. And they, they want to open that bar. They have sometimes a lot of experience, sometimes less. But when they have less, we make sure we really hold their, uh, you know, hold, hold ourselves together and really help them out. But you're you're absolutely right. And the funny thing was, I think the phase thing is it, it is a I'm certain for a fact it was released. It's a DoorDash, it's a DoorDash partnership. Right. The, the, the question is, is it exclusively a DoorDash partnership, or is it also a business model in three months? So. I, to echo right. your point, we'll see in three months what happens. We sure will. Um, I'm I'm curious. You know, you you mentioned Meltdown is is the biggest uh, uh, esports bar uh, across the the globe. Um, it's been around for a very long time, so I'm sure that you have experience with these different cultures uh, where it's yeah. been. Um, can you speak a little bit to the the differences of these different cultures and maybe how you do things differently to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I can only speak about the places where we have bars. Um, you know, they. I mean, the the main difference I would say is the more Mediterranean uh, culture. So you know, we have a bar in Montreal, which is of course a French speaking part of the world. Of course, we are we're Canadian, but we have a slightly different culture. Yep. We have a lot of bars in France, uh, and 
a couple in other places in Spain, and then we have some in England and a bunch in in in, um, in, in Scandinavia. And now we have, of course, our partnerships here. So in the U.S. now it's launched. It's all it's at Hard Rock Cafe. So we're okay. also opening our own our own um, brick and mortars. But right now, Core Meltdown, which is the U.S. Meltdown, lives at Hard Rock. So in uh, four Hard Rocks in the U.S. for now, we have Core Meltdown. Uh, but to answer your your question is. Some of the main differences is uh, when uh, uh, when do people go to the bar? You know, some different countries have completely different drinking cultures. Uh, or you know, in in England, it's incredibly common to 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 go in the middle of the afternoon for for a pint if you're you know if you're working if you're not working with your friends in the afternoon, etc. Uh, and and in the U.S., much less so. I mean, you'll notice here in L.A. that, for example, the majority of bars open at 5 p.m. Right. You know, most pubs in England open at noon or 11 and stay open until until early. So when in the day, um, of course, the drinking age is different. Everywhere else that we have bars, the drinking age is 18. In our bars in, in Sweden, uh, before a certain uh, because we serve food, we count as a restaurant. So before a certain hour, we can have children. Um, sure. So the so I would say that the times, the the age, and the impact of food is the main difference. In a bar in the U.S., unless you're a really bar bar, nighttime bar, cocktail bar, almost every place serves food. Uh, in Europe, the restaurants and bars are very different. Uh, most of our places in uh, in France, for example, do not serve food. So that's, mm. that's that's the main thing. At the end of the day, and then of course each, and then it's funny is each city is completely different. Uh, sure. W- within the same country, on which communities we do well, which to fully answer your question, sorry to give such a long answer, no, is also great. very dependent on who the the GM is. If he or she is super into Rocket League, uh, Rocket League will play a bigger part. In that bar, if they're super into Smash or League, it will play a different part in this bar. But it's uh, at the end of the day, the one thing is that if we're everywhere we have locations, we have amazing patrons. I mean, I'm not saying this like that. I mean, people are respectful. People are there to have fun. And, and the experience is really nice. Like people feel like they're, they're, they're really welcomed. So I will tell you, the crowd in an esports bar is a much more pleasant crowd than a crowd in your your average bar or a sports sports bar. I love that. Definitely need to check one out. Um, as we're rounding out this episode, we've covered quite a bit. You know, we've covered <laughs> yeah, we your career path. We've gone deep on influencer marketing, esports marketing. Obviously, meltdown bars just now. If you wanted the audience to come away with one thing from this episode. What would that be? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, uh, my, my, it kind of goes back to our company motto. If it's fun for us, it's fun for them. There's so many great things to be being done in esports and gaming. There's so many things let, you know yet to be done. Uh, esports has been around for a long time, but I really believe that to take a it, we're kind of still at the beginning. You know, esports is when, when the generation of people are a couple years old now, or even you know, under 10. So, my generation's kids are my age today. That's really when esports will be at its, at its max. When all the decision makers um, grew up in a universe where esports was always there. For you and I, esports was a thing that we did kind of on the side you know we joked about this that yeah. we had to hide and so on uh, but i think the most important thing is esports is the coolest thing in the world and as a result it will continue to to grow and expand and if you have passion in the space you will find a, a good place but also it's good to to not forget that it's a huge industry and as a result skills also very important to to develop yeah, I think what I would echo with what you're saying there is number one, for the brands who are coming to the space with their sponsorship dollars, uh, have patience, you know, uh, talk to people like Felix who really know what they're doing. Um, you know, this this space is getting figured out. And then for young people who want to look work in the industry, you know, I would say really learn these deep skills 
to become an expert on the business side or the production side or whatever vertical you want to work in so that this space can mature and really become a business of entertainment rather than just something that's fun to do but is difficult to make money doing because the more sustainable the business, the more cool stuff we get to do. That's right. I agree. Wonderful. Well, Felix LaHaye, thank you for joining me so much today on the DLC Drop podcast. Before I let you go, what are the ways that people can get in touch with you uh, and United Esports in the ways that you'd like them to? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the chat. Um, you can write me an email if you uh, if you uh, want to get in touch with me directly. My email is felix at unitedesports.com. The company is unitedesports.com. And I also... Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. See, uh, showing my age once again. So, <laughs> hey, I'm yeah, the biggest backer of LinkedIn. I make yeah. no apologies for my LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's always a good way to reach to reach me and us. I am on Twitter at Felix underscore LA, but it's not my my primary platform. Um, so these between all of these, can you can find a, a way to reach me? I hope almost always answer. Uh, or at least I do always do my best to answer. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. I really appreciate being here, John. Thank you for the discussion. My pleasure. Thank you for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. 